It just turned 10 o'clock here.
So if you try it twice, you get the highest of the two marks, right? You know that, no? Okay.
So I noticed from the volume of voices kind of going up that most people are done. Are some people still working? Raise your hand if you are. No, okay, so then we'll start with the lecture. Well, my computer here says 1016, so it means that probably the system has shut you off by now. Okay, so we'll start with the lecture, the last lecture. I'll stand over here because my clicker doesn't work very well if I'm in the center of the room. Let's see, let's try. Okay, so when I say the last lecture, I don't mean it's the last session. We still have two sessions in addition to this one, but the last two sessions will be more participation sessions. We'll, we'll have some activities organized in class, and I've refrained from posting um, announcements or giving you directions on those because I wanted you to focus on this last quiz and then focus on the big quiz, which opens the more and stays open until Friday afternoon, and with that, you'll be done with the hard part of the course. Um, so I want you to do those activities, and then, um, and then I'll post about the um, serious game that we'll play in the next session, and then the ethics panel in the very last session. So yeah, concentrate on getting through the quiz until the end of this week. Okay, so two topics to be covered in this lecture. Um, as a recap, we're still in our unit or our block on new directions in planning theory. And in the last session, we talked about planning theory beyond the Anglosphere, how um, general planning theories, most of which is, have been produced in the UK and the US, how those can, can apply and can be adapted to other parts of the world. And today, we'll continue with that idea. We'll talk about the globalization and the transfer of planning ideas. That's why I had, I had you read um, Ward's chapter about policy transfer. Um, and then we'll have another um, topic covered. We'll talk about technology and the city. So the first part on globalization, here we're more in planning theory territory. And then technology in the city, then we'll be moving into urban theory. Okay? So let's start um, right away. And I wanted to start with this image that Sonia posted um, in her lecture about ideas traveling around. And I really like this because it sort of captures that sentiment, how ideas are not something really rigid. That's why um, a balloon is a nice metaphor for an idea because it travels in soft kind of ways. Um, and ideas, not, not just they travel, but um, they travel nowadays in every direction. For a long time, the study of policy transfer, planning policy transfer from place to place, was, was done from a single perspective, from the West to the rest. So it was like um, the West was considered the source of great planning ideas, of good planning, and then those ideas were sort of pushed upon the rest of the world. Whereas at this point, we're no longer in that stage. Now ideas are traveling um, just in every direction, so they could go from the global north to the global south, but then sometimes turn back, return to the global north, and they can go from the east to the west and back. Okay, so that's, that's an important thing. That's where we're at. The world we live in, that's, that's where we're at. If we had studied policy transfer, say, um, 40 years ago, then it would be a different type of study, but we're not, no longer there now. Okay, so here are some definitions of the, the concept of policy transfer. So um, Stephen Ward, the author that you read, he's used primarily the word policy transfer, but there are quite a few other definitions that you might encounter in the literature. Um, some people will call, um, will call policy transfer, they'll call it network analysis, because in a sense it is an analysis of the relationships between um, this network of actors that can be located within the same country or even in different countries. Um, another one 
subset, I guess, of policy transfer is convergence, where, and that happens where policies in two countries become closer to one another over time. So both countries modify their planning policies to become closer and closer. And one case where that's happening quite a lot is the EU, because the European Union at federal level has made this um, huge effort and continues to make this huge effort to harmonize um, planning, planning policies, planning regulations, planning laws among countries so that the EU is more, more balanced. Right? The, um, it's trying to get away from the traditional north and south divisions, the north of the EU, northern countries or eastern. Um, so southeastern countries having traditionally been um, poor, less developed, and northwestern countries of the EU having been more developed, having better established uh, planning systems and planning traditions. So the idea is through a whole variety of projects and activities, the EU is trying to create this convergence of planning in um, different national contexts. And that's pretty tricky to do because a lot of planning happens at the local level, right? Whereas the EU, the European Union, is a government that operates at federal, it's a, at federal level, it's a federal government. So that's pretty tricky to do because you can create directives at federal level, but then they need to trickle down all the way to the local level. So you can create some directive in Brussels, which is uh, the seat of the EU, but then that needs to translate to a small village in Bulgaria even. And there are many steps, so those two places are um, many steps removed from one another. Um, then another type of policy transfer is uh, what we call diffusion, which is it is transfer, but it's not a voluntary transfer. It's not like someone, in the case of diffusion, it's not as if someone made um, a specific effort to transfer a policy. It's more just the way ideas travel, you know, via the internet, people go to conferences, hear about this and that, try to apply it in their own country. So it just, um, it's a more natural process of, dif of transfer. That's what diffusion is. Then we have the case of benchmarking. This happens when one country or one city decides that um, we want to be like this other place, right? So um, sets, selects another place that's doing better in a particular planning area and um, selects that place as the benchmark, right? The place to, um, to follow, the role model, the, the place to emulate. For example, in Brisbane, we could do a benchmark. We could say that um, in 10 years, we want to be the Amsterdam of Australia for cycling, right? So that's a benchmark. So to achieve that benchmark, it would mean that there would be a whole lot of activities going on at council level. The council would have to invite people from Amsterdam, go over there to um, see how they do things, and try and implement those policies locally. So that's, that's a benchmark. That's what the benchmark is at the basic level. And now I pick two places that are really far away, but it can also happen within, within the same country. So it can be that um, just within, within Australia, Brisbane can pick some policy that um, for which another Australian city is ahead. They can say that the Brisbane City Council can say that in 10 years we want to have a transit system as good as Melbourne's. So that would be our benchmark and try to emulate that. So that's that. And then policy learning and social learning are uh, lesson drawing are again other terms that um, are used quite a lot in policy, in policy transfer literature, but they just involve yeah, just like the term says, learning from the policies of another place, people making an effort to, to learn from others, right? Instead of reinventing the wheel every time, the idea is to cut a little bit newcomer cost. Um, when you're a newcomer, you don't know, you might make mistakes, so you, want, you might want to look at the place that's more advanced, so then you avoid those costs. Okay, and then there is this last type um, of transfer, uh, bandwagoning is called sometimes in the literature. It's when one country or city, it aligns itself with a stronger power and sometimes that cannot, 
is not necessarily a friendly power, but sometimes you might want to make friends with your enemy, so instead of having them against you, they help you, right? So it's a way of, it's a uh, type of politicking for, um, for the benefit of society. Okay, so um, why would planners want to look for ideas elsewhere? And I already mentioned cutting newcomers' costs, but what else? And this has practical relevance for those of you that will work in government or even in private firms, because often if you're given a problem to solve, I mean, how would you do it? Would you not want to look at how some, some other place does it? Yeah, so to solve practical problems, often we just, we just have to, to go by what's known, right? So that happens in practice, and the reality is it's always happened, but um, it's more at this point in time, maybe in the last 20 years, policy transfer has become a very specific subset of planning theory, and that's one of my areas of research. Um, it's always happened, but it just now it's been more formalized with frameworks, and we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a minute. But you probably noticed that because the author, the main author that um, that you read this time um, on policy transfer, Stephen Ward, you saw that he had taken a historical approach to his paper. He was talking about um, European countries trying to emulate one another as early as. Haussmann's period, when Haussmann was doing his um, redesign of Paris, other European cities were trying to uh, look at that and, and emulate that kind of practice. And um, we talked a little bit about that in maybe my first or second lecture when um, we showed how Haussmann's project for Paris, how it had been copied in places as far as Tokyo in Japan, when Tokyo was redesigned, and um, Tehran in Iran. So you might want to revisit, well, you'll revisit the lectures now for the, for the quiz, but that's, that's when we talked about um, that kind of emulation. It's more back then, it wasn't, the study of policy transfer was not formalized just yet, because planning itself was not formalized, was not, was not a profession. So what else, why else would you want to look for ideas elsewhere? Yes, you can learn from the mistakes, yes, you can learn from the mistakes of others, and that's one point of policy transfer that um, I always sort of insist on. I say that there is as much to learn from, um, from negative outcomes as there is to learn from positive outcomes. So a lot of places, they tend to showcase um, their big achievements. That's, that's what they'd like to do. If they've done a nice waterfront project, or if they've done a nice pedestrian mall, or if they've built a new conference center, like you're reading in that article on, on tourism in US cities, places want to showcase those. But a lot of times, you might also want to look at failure, because that's, that's also pretty useful, things that have not worked. And often those tend to be put aside. Cities try to minimize, of course, the impact of failure. No one wants to go and advertise that they put a lot of money into a planning program or a policy and then it failed and it provided no benefits to citizens. But to others, that's also useful to know that this kind of approach just might not work, so you'd want, you'd want to know that. Okay, so we talked about some of these, um, some of these points here, but here I've done it in a little bit more systematic way why uh, policy transfer has become, has become an important area of study now and also as an activity has intensified um, at every level, so based on theory. Now, um, this is a theory that's been synthesized by one of the authors that, um, that are in the book, Peter Evans, he's, he's a planning theorist, and uh, I believe he's based in Australia, actually. Um, you read a paper by him not on policy transfer. You read his paper on, um, read that last week, on community, on community activism, 
Uh, but I wanted you to have, you know, just a little bit of experience with this author because he's quite an important author and I think he's also serving as editor of the main planning theory journal, Planning, planning Theory. Okay, so that's how he has put, put this, all of this together. So at the macro level, so world level, policy transfer has, been, uh, has become important because one, one thing is globalization, globalization at every level, so social globalization, cultural globalization, and economic globalization. So just like everything else, we tend to look beyond, beyond our nose nowadays. We just, um, anything we do, we want to find out what other, what other places are doing. And that goes for planning as it goes for, um, for hobbies like music or painting. We want to know what's going on in the arts or what music is being produced elsewhere and same goes for the planning profession. And this has of course been facilitated quite a lot by the internet. I mean in the past there was policy transfer happening, but it was happening a lot slower because information, yes, traveled, or it has always traveled, but it traveled much, much slowly, like those, like those balloons that I showed on the first slide. Whereas now, information travels in real time. As soon as it's produced, it can just be um, shipped somewhere else. And then uh, another thing that's happened at the macro level is the formation of these um, international policy networks, sometimes called epistemic communities. That's another term you might uh, run across in the literature. And some of these um, policy networks are pushed by these international organizations, the globalizers, they call them the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. They have uh, people posted all over the world that push different policies in parts of um, different parts of the world, wherever they, wherever they operate. Okay, so that's for the macro level, the, the big view. Um, then we have the meso level, meaning at national, at national level. Why would different countries, so at the national, so it would be more planning laws. It wouldn't be planning projects. At national, so national governments would not design projects, I mean, unless it's perhaps major projects like infrastructure, but the smaller projects, those belong to cities. But at national level, uh, what's happened a lot is, well again, internationalization, which links to globalization um, up here. Um, but one thing that's happened, which we've talked a whole lot in this course, is neoliberalism, right? Which has produced economic austerity. So a lot of places, they find themselves, a lot of countries, they find themselves in dire straits now, economically. Um, the welfare states of the past, of the uh, Keynesian era, of the Fordist era, have been dismantled. So then, Having run out of money, places now feel like they need to be creative. They need to come up with ideas quickly to respond to the needs of, of their people. And the needs are now more intense because people have more exposure about what's going on elsewhere. In the past, you could keep one people isolated. There was no internet. There wasn't as much TV, so you could tell your own people, oh, we're doing fine in our country, there is no problem here, I mean, that's how the whole world is. You could much more easily lie to your own local population like that. Whereas nowadays, people know, because there is internet, there is, there is TV, um, information circulates, so they know that there are places out there that might be doing better, so people are a lot more demanding now, that you can't fool them very easily, right? So constituencies are very demanding, and uh, at the same time, states, national states, they have less resources. They find themselves at the spot, at the tight spot. So then they need to look for ideas, and they often have to look elsewhere when they need to come up with those creative ideas. Then another thing that's happened, and this is a phenomenon that started quite a lot in the late 80s, and then it intensified through the 90s and 2000s, is this um, push for decentralization. So a lot of countries in the Fordist era, the, the modernist era, the era of big government, 
that we've talked about. Often they did planning at the national level, so it was the, especially if we're talking about smaller countries. In Europe, a lot of countries are small. I mean, the U.S. has always been more decentralized, but in Europe, but sometimes also lar large countries like, like China, a lot of planning happened at the national level, so there would be these national planning institutes pretty much deciding where every building went. So from the national level telling cities, here you are to put a school, here you are to make room for a conference center, over here you are going to put your big infrastructure, the factory goes over there, so all of that at national level. And then later, countries or people got sort of sick of that approach. They said, well, the government is this big entity far removed, it's out there, and we want decisions to be made more at the local level so that our local politicians can respond to us more directly. So then because of uh, those increased expectations on part of people in more decentralized context, um, so that's, how, that's where um, planners found themselves in this spot where they needed to come up again with creative ideas and that's been a motivation to, to look elsewhere, to look at other places, how they, how they do things. And then at the micro level, so now at the urban level where a lot of planning obviously takes place. Uh, why would planners want to look elsewhere? Well, s some of the same reasons as why planners at national level would want to look, to look elsewhere for, uh, for ideas, so more demanding constituencies nowadays. Uh, but then also problems have become much, much more intense. The environmental agenda now is at the forefront in many cities, so that alone creates this need to come up with, with solutions, and it's rare that any place will just have all the answers at home, right? So, say even in this educational setting, no matter how much effort we put, we can't provide you with all the ideas about all solutions. A lot of solutions you'll have to figure out for yourselves once you're in the front lines of the planning profession once you're on the job. And besides, I mean, no matter how many ideas we discuss here while you're getting your education, planning profession, just its nature is such that it always changes. So new things will come up even two, three years from now. So it's like there is this continuous quest for updates and education in planning, that's just the way it is. I mean, there is no guarantee that now you got your UQ education, you know it all, right? We're trying to give, you know, here a menu of concepts and ideas, but five years down the road, these, all of these might change. I mean, some of the proposals that we discuss here, they, make, they might become obsolete in the past, and technology certainly has a role to play there, so we'll talk about technology next. I mean, we don't know how cities will look like with all these changes in technology. Okay, so I already talked about this. This is not just planning theory in the classroom. Let's study policy transfer just for the sake of it. But the idea is that um, you'll need this. I mean, you'll be doing this. It's almost guaranteed, no matter what job you get in planning, at one point or another, you'll have to look at how other places do things. There is no way now that one can be a parochial kind of planner, just care about the local context and do well, just, um, just with that. And besides, the reality of the planning profession now is that often as a planner, you might also be asked to provide advice to others, so besides getting advice from others, you might also be asked to, um, to be a role model or a mentor. You might be asked to host a delegation from another city. If there is something you've done well in your own context, you might be asked to share that information. So, and when I say information, information both about the outcome, so this is how we did, this is how it looks like. Say we redeveloped um, the South Bank, and it looks beautiful like this, but how did we go about it? So you'd have to know about the process, explain it, put it in a package that's transferable, right? So that might be part of your, um, part of your task. Yeah, yeah, you have to reciprocate, that's right. And that's especially the case if you work, 
I mean, it will depend on where, where you work in the, in the future. But that's especially the case if you work in a city that's generally considered, you know, has world city status, that's considered uh, to be at the forefront of planning innovation. Places like this, they're always asked to act as role models. Um, a few years ago, when I was still doing my postdoc in Holland, so I interviewed some people from the city of Amsterdam in Holland, and because that's one such city, it's considered to be very, very advanced. It has um, a very mature planning system, a very long planning tradition. Cycling is, of course, the feather um, on its head. It's um, world known for cycling. So they have a whole department that just deals with hosting international delegations because the city is almost like revolving doors. It's one delegation after another that comes in to, um, to get inspired and get ideas from, from the city of Amsterdam. And that might happen quite a lot here in Brisbane in the future because you know what our big aspiration is now. Brisbane, Australia's new world city, right? So we're trying to move from that place where we were getting ideas from others to a place where we might be um, acting as a role model for cities that are perhaps behind. So that's the practical relevance of this whole field of study. Okay, so this framework was also in your reading, ways to study policy transfer. And when I say ways, um, this, this is again, it's a framework, it's a way to help you organize, or you or anybody who studies transfer. It's a way to help organize ideas because there is no way that you can do, um, for example, your master's thesis and try and do all three things in one shot, right? If some of you decide to um, do a research study on policy transfer, you'd probably end up taking one of these approaches, otherwise it's just, um, it's just too much. So what are these approaches? Well, the first one is descriptive. So description of how policy transfer is made. What's, what's going on, who was involved, who came, who went, what kind of ideas they looked at, so description. The second approach is more analytical, so it tries to uh, explain why, right? Analysis now, why it happened, where was the need in both the lender country and the borrower country? Why did the borrower country need to look elsewhere for ideas? And then why did they pick one particular lender to, um, to approach? And then what was the interest of the lender? Why did the lender want it to act as a lender? It might be all kinds of ideas there. Perhaps they wanted to uh, provide the technical assistance because they were hoping that people then from their own country would be employed to implement the plan. That happens quite a lot. So a country might say, yeah, I'll tell you, you know, how to do this. I'll, I'll assist you. But then when it comes to, uh, when it's time to build that piece of infrastructure that you're trying to build, you also have to hire my own engineers. That's why I'm doing this in economic interest. So that's where the why comes into play. And then um, the third approach is prescription. So. This starts from the assumption that in the past, policy transfer in this country or between these two countries or two cities has not yielded the results that we're hoping for. Therefore, um, here's the way to do it better, right? Prescription. So description, analysis, and prescription. These are the three ways to, main ways to, um, to study planning policy transfer. And, um, so in your reading, there was a whole framework that Ward had proposed. Um, and this is another framework that takes that a little bit, a little bit farther. So there is a group of authors now that are doing all this work around policy transfer. And they're always to, uh, trying to improve upon each other's work. So try to make these frameworks for the analysis of transfer more elaborate, trying to capture all the facets of this area of, um, of inquiry. So I've put up here uh, one framework that I've used in the past. Um, and I've used it in this, um, in this article called Going Dutch, the export of sustainable land use and transport planning concepts from the Netherlands. 
Um, but then, again, this is not um, a case where I've just come up with this framework from scratch. This is also based on another framework that was prepared by these two other authors called um, Dolowitz and March. I think both their names are, their first names are David. <laughs> I'm not sure. But so they have proposed a version of this, a more, a more expanded version of this. We contracted it a little bit in this article. And so it has these seven elements. So one important part of policy transfer is to look at agents. Who are the people that care about policy transfer and, um, and do policy transfer? And these can be, I mean, they're not just urban planners. It can be politicians. Sometimes politicians come up with, with ideas. So one politician goes on a delegation in another country. And sometimes it can even be for other purposes. I mean, they might be doing some exchange, whatever, with their peers. But then they look at some local project that's, that's interesting. And they might say, oh, that looks like a really good idea. Why don't I do this in my own country or my own city? Because it's brought a lot of benefits to this country, and this will raise my own political profile if I import it in my own country. So politicians are often important agents of transfer. Then bureaucrats, I mean, planning technicians, of course, are agents of transfer, and they might do transfer in a more systematic way. They might even prepare reports. I've been asked, you know, when I've worked for government, sometimes I've been asked to prepare a report about um, sustainable transport plans. So once I was asked to just look over um, the internet and see how many cities had plans that were called sustainable transport, just, just as a research. For, for the, this was for the city of San Francisco many years ago. But that, that happens you know, to, to planners in, um, in the public sector a lot. Um, then it can be pressure groups, of course, from, from the community. Sometimes communities themselves might do that kind of research. And they might say, so the local, say the local planners are not responding to their needs. So then the community could say, um, look, you're doing this, you're dealing with this problem very, very poorly, but look, we've done some research and there are some cities out there that do this much, much better. Why don't you look at these examples? So sometimes if planners haven't done that homework, community groups will do that. Then there are these policy entrepreneurs, people that deal with policy transfer professionally, and they're the ones, sometimes they call them a little bit... Um, in a derogatory way, they call them policy mongers. Because they're the people that um, sort of transfer these planning templates from place to place. And often urban designers, people in urban design and architecture are a little bit guilty of that. Um, because the same type of design, say these theme, especially this, this happens a lot for these theme parks. Those tend to be replicated from place to place, or it happens in places, in the design of places like pedestrian, pedestrian malls. Those are, all, uh, are often copycat examples that, um, that get copied um, from place to place. So yeah, policy entrepreneurs, so professional policy transfer actors, they, um, they're important. Knowledge institutions, meaning universities and academics, were, of course, at the forefront of policy transfer. And here, my paper here is one example of that, because that's a part of what we study in planning. But then also, besides the research, I mean, it's also the teaching. Just the fact that I'm mentioning various examples here, that's, in a sense, a way to do policy transfer, right? Talking to students about examples from from around the world. And then um, international organizations, I already mentioned the big globalizers, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, they also tend to have this template that they try to apply from place to place. And they don't necessarily go by template because they're, they're evil or they're trying to impose. Sometimes they're trying to impose, depending you know, what, what the economic interest is, that, that also happens. But sometimes they go by templates just because it's more efficient. You know, there is no time. Sometimes they have these very, very um, short time frames to do a project. And so they're forced 
to apply the same model to different places. There is no time to tailor it to local circumstances. So they're like, here is a package of policies. Try and apply it in this country, in um, Asia, just the same way as we did it in Africa, because there's just no time now to, um, to try and fit it to the local context. And often, these kind of impositions, they do yield some very, very poor, poor results. But I do want to make a point that they're not always trying to, um, they're not always in bad faith. I mean, they get criticized quite a lot. Um, these organizations for, for pushing their own agenda, but they're not always in bad faith. I mean, sometimes they try to do good things, and then, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And then supranational institutions, I just mentioned the example of the European Union, that's the supranational institution that's trying to, um, that's trying to harmonize planning policies um, among, I don't know how many countries are in the EU now, 28 countries, so it's a huge job. I mean, we can barely harmonize policies in Australia between cities. Imagine try to harmonize among 28 countries, all of them with a different national language. It's, yeah, it's a brutal task. So when we talk about um, agents, these are some of the aspects that we might want to look at. We might want to look at their own policy belief systems, we might want to look at the motivations on both sides, so the motivations of the lender, the motivation of the borrowers, what do they expect to get out of this whole process of transfer, do they expect any benefits, what benefits, is it economic benefits or social benefits or planning outcome benefits, so it's not always built environment benefits, it can be a whole other set. And of course, all of these agents, they come with their own baggage of attitudes and cultural values, so it's quite tricky to harmonize borrower and lender value systems. And the resources might also differ, so um, that's why in the reading that you did, uh, you saw that um, Ward's framework, that he made a clear difference between um, voluntary transfer and imposed transfer. And the big difference between those two kinds is in the resources. So if one country is more, so the lender is more, if the lender is more powerful, then it's often transferred by imposition. If both borrower and lender are at the same economic level, they have the same power and resources, then transfer tends to be more voluntary. Okay, then we might want to look at objects. And the objects can be built environments, so things that we can see. Sometimes a place can be, oh, I really like um, this waterfront redevelopment that you've done in this place, so it's something visible. But sometimes it's invisible things like policies and regulations, and those are um, a little bit trickier to transfer. So often these excursions, these um, delegations that go from place to place to get ideas, they often tend, tend to focus on the physical environment because they're just easier. You know, you see a nice residential development, and you're like, oh yeah, I want just that in my city. Whereas policies, because they're abstract, they're, they're harder to, to conceptualize and to grasp. And then motivations, I won't uh, talk about these a lot because I feel like um, Stephen Ward's framework was all about motivations. That's how, in the reading that you did, that's how he had organized this whole reading. Uh, coercive, voluntary versus coercive type of transfer. And then all the stuff in between, the bounded rationality, um, what we call bounded rationality in, in policy transfer language. Okay, so then we might want to look at the process, and the process has two components, the process of transfer. One is the direction, so where is the transfer going? Is it within one nation? Is it between nations, or is it just two cities that are, that are involved, or more cities? And then we also want to look at the degree of the outcome of transfer. So what's going on? Um, was some kind of direct copying happening, or was it some kind of adaptation, emulation, something like that, and um, some hybrid outcome where a country took some ideas from somewhere else but then adapted them to, the, to their local context? 
And it tends to be that the direct copying happens more often where there is a power imbalance between borrower and lender. So if the lender is a lot more powerful, the borrower sees itself you know, as a bit of an so more in inferior position. So then it will take a policy or a project wholesale and try to apply it at home. Whereas in more advanced planning systems, there is more emulation and hybridization going on. And then sometimes policy transfer does not have direct outcomes that you can see, but it just involves simple inspiration, but that's also useful. You know, just to be able to look at a different context helps planners because uh, it's often the case that you understand your home context better if you compare it against a different context. If you're immersed in a situation, it's hard to distance yourself and really be objective about it. Once you compare it to another place, then you can be, oh, right, so there are different ways to do it. I mean, why have we done it always the way we've done it? That's where you notice also where the problems might be at home, even if you don't do anything about it yet. But just the inspiration is good, exposure um, is good. And then a big part of policy transfer um, analysis is the study of obstacles. So why is policy transfer not happening, right? And this is key to me because I feel that at this point in time, you know, we have the internet, we're globalized and all of that. So a lot of planning solutions are known. I mean, I've asked you before, you know, what are some of the problems that we have in Brisbane? And people have said um, our public transport system isn't very good, and what else? So public transport does does come a lot, come up a lot. Housing affordability is starting to become a problem, no? What what else? Sometimes, personally, you know. Um, as a foreigner, I mean, I grew up in a warm climate, but maybe not, not as warm um, as this. So sometimes I feel design for climate, for climate control is not quite at the level that it could be urban design for, for climate or in preparation for climate change. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have green spaces or sometimes even simpler things like sometimes they don't even have a colonnade in front, which at some point in Brisbane was required. If you were to put, put up a, a large building, you had to have some kind of portico in front so people could be in the shade in summer. And then at some point they scraped that requirement, they just scrapped. The requirement is just no longer required. So there, I mean, there is room for improvement, right? And I feel all the solutions to these problems are known. There are places out there that do these things better. So the question is then why, why aren't we copying the, the best practice, right? So that's where the study of obstacles is very, very, very important, right? Assuming that most um, solutions to planning problems are known, or there are places that could serve as an example or as a role model, but why aren't we looking at those places? Um, when it comes to cycling, why are we not Copenhagen, right? What's, what's preventing us? And um, so planning theory says that there are a number of, number of obstacles. So some are cognitive obstacles. It's like this mental barriers that we can't be Copenhagen because we're not. I mean, they speak a different language. They're in a different part of the world. Um, they just have a different culture, so it just will never be Copenhagen. That's a cognitive barrier, right? Sometimes it can be that uh, the policies of another country are too complex to emulate. I mean, the outcomes might look simple enough, but then to get there, um, the way their policy system is set up might be so different to ours that there is no way to um, sort of overlap the two. To turn, say, to turn Brisbane into Copenhagen, there might be um, so many more steps um, to apply here because of our own local rules and regulations that it will take a whole lot more time, a whole lot longer if we ever get there. Right, then some 
Some obstacles might be environmental, and when I say environmental, I don't mean environmental as in pollution, but environment. Uh, well, in terms of the policy environment, that's that's what I mean by um, by environment. So it can be that the local elites are not interested in whatever policy um, is being proposed, in whatever progressive pol planning policy is being proposed, and it is often the case that you really have to have the elites on your side to make things happen. Even though we often say that um, policy change needs to come from the people, you know, the people need to own it, the local populations, but it is crucial to, um, to engage elites. And um, one of the articles that you read, the Peter Evans article, when he was talking about work with, um, with the communities, he dwells quite a lot on that, on that topic about how communities, they need to make friends with powerful politicians if they want um, change in their favor, right? Uh, sometimes it can be technical constraints. I mean, in Brisbane, we can say, well, we're just, this is too hilly a city to make it into a cycling city, you know, if I'm to stick now with the example of cycling. So it can be that. Or some people will say, well, just in the summer, it's just too hot to cycle, so it will never happen. This will never be Copenhagen because that's just the way our environment is completely different. Our, there are technicalities that cannot be cannot be overcome. And I believe those can be overcome, but we're talking about obstacles, what people might say that um, that's preventing change. Right? And then again, public opinion, again, aligning public opinion with uh, planners' progressive views is very important, otherwise that will always constitute a barrier. And you can say whatever you want, that, oh, people just don't know anything, but fact of the matter is that it will still remain a barrier. So if you want to achieve change, you need to uh, work with public opinion and the media. You need to act as a planner, the planner as an educator. And then the output, finally, the product, what, we, what you see at the end of this whole process of transfer. Well, the outputs can be soft, uh, just what I was talking about, ideas, inspiration, and that, that can be, you know, pretty good. I mean, if you get people to change their mind, that's already a huge, a huge step. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it looks like it, that's already a technical constraint right here because the climate, I mean, <laughs> you can't change the climate. The climate is the climate, so you have to, to work around that. Um, and then outputs can be, can be hard, something that you see, so a, built, a change in the built environment or a change in policy. So that's the kind of thing we want, but we want that only if it's owned by the local context. I mean, if it's an imposed kind of change, then it's not necessarily so good. Just because it's a hard outcome, don't take it to be good necessarily. It depends on how it was done. It depends on the motivation for transfer. And then there is also the case of failure. Just transfer does not work because there wasn't enough information or there were too many barriers. Um, or sometimes can be some transfer, but it's incomplete or inappropriate. Sometimes the wrong elements might be transferred that do not work with the local context. So this constitutes a framework for one of you to study policy transfer if you wanted to study it um, empirically. Okay, so now we move to the second part of the lecture, uh, which is on technology, but... Uh, since this is a different topic, um, would you like to take a quick break? Yes. Yes. That's, yes, that's a type of policy transfer looking at your own past. That's, that's also, because some cities, um, they feel, especially the ones that have a longer urban history, 
um, say, in Europe. Uh, so sometimes they might say, oh, in the past we just did things better because cities were more walkable, more pedestrian friendly, so we'll just look at our own place, but, but in the past. So, that's, um, so you're saying where does it fall in the framework? Yeah, that's a form of transfer for sure. Yes, that yeah, that definitely. And I think it's on the on the framework. So I've put it here, um, learning from your own past. But I put in parentheses non-transfer because sometimes the past cannot be replicated. So people are more inspired. Um, that often happens in the case when you're critical of how you do things in the, in the present. You're like, oh, in the past we did things much, much better. But yeah, that's, that, that could be a type of transfer. Okay, so um, do you want to take a five-minute break and then we continue? It's 11.10 till 11.15 and then, then we continue, stretch out, have a drink of water.
Okay, so let's get restarted. Okay, so technology and the city moving on to, into urban theory territory now. So David Harvey's um, paper that you read, uh, he talked a little bit about globalization, I mean a little bit, quite a lot about globalization. And one of the big points that he made was that um, globalization is happening in this shaky ground. I mean, no um, local or national system is fixed. So countries are trying to globalize and some policies are being harmonized around the world, but that's not happening in any kind of static environment. So the places that globalize within themselves, they're, they're in a dynamic state. They're always, they're always changing. And Harvey did not talk about the role of technology, but technology at this point is one of those factors that are um, making places be very dynamic, that are causing um, immense change within very short periods of time. So that's why I thought it's important to, um, to have a little bit of a discussion about technology here. However, um, I want to say that I want to keep it at a very abstract, kind of higher level, this discussion, rather than get into the nitty gritty of the role of technology, because the reality is we don't know how technology will play out. We really don't know what the city will look like in 30 to 50 years, because the changes are just so rapid. I mean, there is no way, unless I had a crystal ball to see the future, there is no way. I could know at this point in time what it will look like. There are some people out there that are making predictions, but they don't know either, right? It's, it's all very speculative at this point. Okay, I've put up um, the definition of technology. Here, it's, um, the word itself was invented, it was started to be used um, around the 17th century, but by now it just, um, a very common term. We hear about technology a whole lot. Um, and do not confuse technology with technocracy. Remember this slide? This was um, back in the lecture when we talked about ideology. And I said that technocracy is becoming a sort of ideology of its own. It's a favorite concept of neoliberalism because it makes things appear to be you know technical rather than political making every decision having every decision be be made based on metrics and standardized forms and and stuff like that uh, but the reality is technology and technocracy these are ideologies in themselves because they make you uh, look at the world through the eyes, the logic of, te of technology, as opposed to some other logic, which is, which is possible. So let's review 10 common technologies here and see what their effect is, not necessarily on cities, I mean, on, including on cities, but in society in general. So one is uh, an interesting one, the mechanical clock. And the mechanical clock was invented in the Middle Ages, was invented in monasteries to keep time for the monks so they would know when to pray, right? So initially it was meant to serve the needs of religion. However, um, the clock as a technology, some people, you know, the historians of technology, they'll say that it completely transformed society and economy because in some sense, Capitalism itself would not have been possible without the clock, without a standardized system to keep time, right? So this regimented life that we lead now, where class starts exactly at 10 o'clock and the quiz shuts off at 10.15, all of this would not have been possible without, without the clock. So it's almost like that particular technology owns us at this point rather than we owning the technology. It runs our lives. So in that sense, it is an ideology. We're living our life based on 
the logic of this particular um, technology. And some people I put here, um, Max Weber. Some people will say that um, capitalism was born out of the Protestant work ethic, Protestantism being a religion that was born out of um, the Catholic religion, so there was this big split. Martin Luther uh, created his own group and made the Catholic, re reformed the Catholic religion. And um, then the Protestant religion uh, came along with this um, somewhat different set of ethical rules. One of those was the, the work, the work ethic. Some people will say that that's what made capitalism possible in Europe. Protestantism was born in Europe first and then it spread um, elsewhere. But other people will say that really capitalism without the mechanical clock would not have been possible, um, irrespective of Protestantism as a religion. So I put up um, a short video here um, from Max Weber, and we don't have time to watch it now, but um, click, click on the link to, to have a really quick overview of uh, Weber's ideas. On, well, he wrote a book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and this video summarizes it for you in five minutes. Okay, so the telegraph. The telegraph is something that, so one of the early inventions that made possible the spread of information in much, much um, more rapid times. Um, so it was invented back in the 19th century. And until the telegraph came along, people only knew about news from their local region, their local city. So all of those news were very relevant to them because they involved people that they knew, just their own surroundings. Whereas with the invention of the telegraph, they started to know things that were happening elsewhere in the nation. And some people will say that this technology, um, it seems innocuous, you know, it's just a technology. I mean, it doesn't have a political meaning or ideology. But historians will say that that's what made possible the creation of a national space. That's when people started to see uh, whole chunks of spaces belonging to their own nation. I mean, before the telegraph was there, they saw um, the world as their own city. That's what was relevant to them. They couldn't be thinking, you know, if they were sitting in Milan, they couldn't be thinking about Sicily so much because Sicily was really far away. They didn't know what people were doing down in Sicily, right? And with the invention of the telegraph, they could know those things. And in some way, that was good, led to the invention of nation states, but, or strengthening of um, nation states, but the reality is ma it made, um, it created this space between people and information. So, some historians or um, communication scientists will say that, well, now we have all this glut of information from all over the world, and if you think about it, how much of it is relevant to our lives, really? You know, it's really sad to hear about events in other parts of the world, you know, bad things that happen, wars, but um, the reality is you just really can't do anything about it. You hear about it and you're here. Maybe you can do something about it once a year when you vote, or once every four years even, you know, whenever, whenever it's time to vote. But there isn't a huge amount of, um, of action that you can take, right, about, about those news. So it's created this space of disconnect in the world also. Then numerical grades, so this should interest um, a lot of you because <laughs> I've noticed that um, some people believe that numerical grades are very important. Every single grade um, is important. And uh, well, one thing to say is that uh, numerical grades did not always exist. They're a relatively recent invention of humankind. Um, they say that they were, invent they were started to be used in Cambridge in the 18th century. Some people will say Yale in the, in the US, but it's not, it's not so important, the exact date. It's more, we haven't been using them for, for very long. And on one hand, it's a good technology in the sense that it just makes it easy to compare among a large group of people. But then, on the other hand, um, 
it's created this illusion that um, we can have some sort of objective measure of human performance. Um, it cre the grades they create this illusion as if performance is something that's located somewhere inside somebody's brain or knowledge or comprehension, and that can be revealed through a number, which is not, it's, it's only an illusion, it's not, it's not reality. So, can worthiness be given a number? Or intelligence, and I'll go to IQ test in, um, in uh, the next few slides. Or education, can education equate a number, possibly? I don't think so. Yes, it, well, it has practical value, for sure. Yes. 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 That's right. There are all these qualitative aspects of each student's experience that a single number cannot possibly capture. You know, it reduces a whole person's experience into a number. But because we have numbers available, now there is this illusion that everything can be measured through numbers. That's what the numbers are technology. Numbers themselves are technology. And they create that, um, that type of illusion. So here are some other applications of numbers. Polls, the same thing. Polls try to capture public opinion, and uh, they create this um, mathematical illusion of reality, as if opinions cannot possibly be captured unless you give them a number, that these many people are in favor of this, and these many people are against this. And in some sense, it lets polit polls, the use of polls, it lets politicians of the hook because instead of being directly responsive to, um, to their um, electorate, now they're like, oh, I'll do a poll and I'll um, survey people what they want, right? As if opinion, again, as if it's like intelligence, as if it's something that's located in the brain and you can pull it out through a poll. So that's the, that's the trick of this technology. Standardized forms, again, staple of bureaucracy. This is the kind of technology, this is the sort of thing that reduces everything into standardization. It kills all nuance, right? So it is an ideology in itself, and I'm sure you've already dealt with these quite a lot already at university and outside of university. Then, television. This is another... Um, technology with a huge ideology attached behind it. It's a little bit like telegraph. It just changed the space of discourse. It made it even broader. If the telegraph made it national, this made it international and global. But the television, um, unlike the telegraph, that was still a written kind of information, television, because of um, its nature, the form of the media, um, has the attached disadvantage that it turns every issue, including very serious issues like wars and um, environmental catastrophe, it turns them into entertainment. So everything is created, I mean, it is created for the purpose of informing, but it needs to be in an entertaining type of format. That's the nature of this media. So then it creates this illusion that everything that you uh, follow on television needs to be interesting. Otherwise, it's not worthy of being followed, right? So it's changed culture and cultural life and discourse. It's changed it into entertainment. And this kind of theory it comes from a book by um, Neil Postman. Um, he was a um, communication um, communication scholar who was based at New York University, is no longer alive, and he wrote a brilliant book in the 80s called Amusing Ourselves to Death, about the role of television in public life and in, and in culture. And they, um, they published a new edition recently, and Neil Postman was no longer alive when um, the new edition came out, but his son wrote a preface to the new edition, and he said that now 
his father's work has become even more relevant because, rather less relevant, because now we have the internet in addition to television, and that's made all the issues that came with television as a media, it's made them even more, more severe. I mean, it has advantages, of course, but now playing the devil's advocate, talking about um, the disadvantage, providing a critique. You all know the advantages of the internet, so we don't need to go over those. IQ test, the same thing as with numerical grades, the same kind of idea, illusion that intelligence is something physical located in the brain that can be manifest via numbers. Computer. So I won't talk about computers a lot because you all know about computers. You have plenty of experience with computers. But at this point in time, the issue with computers is that, again, they've created this illusion that life just cannot exist without computers, right? We've just forgotten that things can possibly be done without computers. There are other ways to do things. It's, it's possible, you know, humankind existed for millennia without, without computers. And we need to also think, what are we losing by um, having adapted this technology into our lives? So do we own it or does it own us? Something to, to think about. I don't know the answer, but something to think about. And then here we get more into urban planning. Territory, the car, and you know, the usual critique of the car, it's helped uh, create sprawl and it's created pollution and um, you know, the typical critique that you'd get in a transportation planning course. But now from um, an urban theory kind of perspective, uh, the point is that the car has come to determine how we live our lives. So again, like I was talking about the computer just before numbers as a technology, before even getting to the computer, but just numbers, the use of digits, um, we have to think about do we own the car or does it own us at this, at this point in time? And the way we've set up our cities, have we done it just based on the logic of this particular technology? And is there another way to set up cities that does not follow the logic of this one? technology, one dominant technology. Not to mention that the cars also act in many cases as a way to express personal identity and even social standing in society. So there is all this meaning and ideology attached to this object, really, that's produced in a factory, that's mass produced in a factory. Smart cities, this is um, a concept that pretty much combines all the available technologies to, um, to help humankind run our lives more smoothly, right? That's the basic idea of the smart city, that at some point in time you'll just be pushing buttons and things will just happen around you very, very easily. So on one hand, that's good. I mean, I, for one, wish that the blackboard, for example, would work a whole lot better. <laughs> you just push buttons and things would happen rather than um, run into some glitch in pretty much every session. So sure, I'd welcome that. But um, the illusion of the smart city is that technology now can solve all problems of human beings. So. It's a model of urban development that's guided by technological optimism. And uh, critics will say that, well, even if we have smart cities, we'll still be human beings. I mean, people will be still suffering from uh, physical and mental health problems and um, this and that. So it's not like we will change as people, but we might be forced to run our lives based on technolo technological logic rather than some other kind of logic. Okay, so to summarize, two points that, um, that are marked here in red, and you can read the, the rest um, at home, the takeaway, the takeaway points. But 
The main thing is that when we introduce a new technology into our lives and into the city, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same city plus the technology. We might have created a completely different thing. We might have given life to a monster. So we should not assume that any technology is innocuous and free of ideology, right? It might just completely change things. It might be a completely different game. The city plus a new technology. And another point to remember is, and this is, again, it's an ethical kind of question, just because a technology exists, are we forced to use it? Should we be compelled to use any new technology that becomes available just because it's there? Think about it. And one way to think about it is by considering all those people that are losing their jobs because of new technological advances. Is that good or bad? I don't know the answer, but think about it. Should we use all new technology or do we make a decision as a society or a species to just not adapt some technologies that we could use. Okay, so now um, what's left of the session, I want to dedicate it to the issue of self-driving cars because that's the new big technology that's coming and it's expected to change cities by quite a lot. So I will do this instead of giving a lecture on this because we really don't know. I mean, we're at the stage of speculation. Like I said, we, we don't know how it will play out, what cities will look like when cars become completely self-driving with no, um, no human driver involved. But um, I want you to consider two things. So the first one is the ethical dilemmas of uh, self-driving cars. And that comes from a TED talk. It's attached to a whole lecture on this technology, automated driving. So you might, if you want to at home, you can do the whole um, lesson and look at the questions and look at the additional uh, resources. And then um, this is another TED talk um, that discusses um, the specific relationship with urban space, right? So ethics and then urban space. So I'll put, I'll put on the first one that's shorter on the ethics. So you can see here is the lesson attached to it. So if you want to dig deeper, there are lots of additional resources. In future, you're barreling down the highway in your self-driving car and you find yourself boxed in on all sides by other cars. Suddenly, a large, heavy object falls off the truck in front of you. Your car can't stop in time to avoid the collision, so it needs to make a decision. Go straight and hit the object, swerve left into an SUV, or swerve right into a motorcycle. Should it prioritize your safety by hitting the motorcycle? Minimize danger to others by not swerving? even if it means hitting the large object and sacrificing your life, or take the middle ground by hitting the SUV, which has a high passenger safety rating. So what should the self-driving car do? If we were driving that boxed-in car in manual mode, whichever way we'd react would be understood as just that, a reaction, not a deliberate decision. It would be an instinctual panicked move with no forethought or malice, but if a programmer were to instruct the car to make the same move, given conditions it may sense in the future, well, that looks more like premeditated homicide. Now, to be fair, self-driving cars are predicted to dramatically reduce traffic accidents and fatalities by removing human error from the driving equation. Plus, there may be all sorts of other benefits, eased road congestion, decreased harmful emissions, and minimized unproductive and stressful driving time. But accidents can and will still happen, and when they do, their outcomes may be determined months or years in advance by programmers or policymakers. And they'll have some difficult decisions to make. 
is tempting to offer up general decision-making principles like minimize harm, but even that quickly leads to morally murky decisions. For example, let's say we have the same initial setup, but now there's a motorcyclist wearing a helmet to your left and another one without a helmet to your right. Which one should your robot car crash into? If you say the biker with the helmet because she's more likely to survive, then aren't you penalizing the responsible motorist? If instead you say the biker without the helmet because he's acting irresponsibly, then you've gone way beyond the initial design principle about minimizing harm, and the robot car is now meeting out street justice. The ethical considerations get more complicated here. In both of our scenarios, the underlying design is functioning as a targeting algorithm of sorts. In other words, it's systematically favoring or discriminating against a certain type of object to crash into. And the owners of the target vehicles will suffer the negative consequences of this algorithm through no fault of their own. Our new technologies are opening up many other novel ethical dilemmas. For instance, if you had to choose between a car that would always save as many lives as possible in an accident, or one that would save you at any cost, which would you buy? What happens if the cars start analyzing and factoring in the passengers of the cars and the particulars of their lives? Could it be the case that a random decision is still better than a predetermined one designed to minimize harm? And who should be making all of these decisions anyhow? Programmers? Companies? Governments? Reality may not play out exactly like our thought experiments, but that's not the point. They're designed to isolate and stress test our intuitions on ethics just like science experiments do for the physical world. Spotting these moral hairpin turns now will help us maneuver the unfamiliar road of technology ethics and allow us to cruise confidently and conscientiously into our brave new future. And you understand, I mean, the basic idea of self-driving cars is that people will not own cars so much anymore, but it will be a system like Uber cars now, but without, without the driver, where you just call the car, it takes you to your destination while you read the newspaper or do whatever, it drops you off and then the car goes off to pick another passenger, so it won't be your property anymore. So that's another thing that's predicted, self-driving cars will dramatically reduce car ownership. But still, we don't know how that will play out. Maybe there will still be so many self-driving cars on the road, it will still be a traffic jam, we don't know. Get ready, cause here I come. Well, last thing, I'd like to introduce our new... What do the places where we live say about us? I want you to try and imagine way into the future. Archaeologists have just discovered our ancient civilization. They're extremely excited. First, they discover our centers of commerce. Okay, they're a little bit underwhelmed at this point. But I like to think the people in the future are optimistic, so they keep digging. Next, they find our urban landscapes. At this point in time, some of the archaeologists are starting to question their career path. But they persevere, and they keep digging. And then they find our monumental structures designed to protect our most prized possessions. <laughs> what do these places say about us? What do they say about how we value the places in which we live? Over the past 100 years, nothing has dominated and dictated the design of our cities more than the car. Today's modern cities are designed for cars. For the vast majority of people, 
the thought of living without a car seems unimaginable. And we have built our cities around that. But the convenience and mobility of cars has come at a cost to our city. Today's cities now sprawl over vast territories in an unsustainable way. Our neighborhoods and our communities are segregated and divided by large roads and highways. But the design of our cities over the past 100 years does not need to dictate the design of our cities into the future. Driverless cars, the shared economy, and a renewed interest in sustainable forms of transportation like walking, cycling, and public transit have a chance to transform how we think of mobility and in the process give us the ability to transform and reshape the places we live. In the future, I believe our cities are not going to be designed for cars, but instead are going to be designed for the people that live in them. Now, if we were to go around the world today, we could come across and discover many incredible and beautiful cities. These cities have one thing in common. These cities were built and predate the automobile. I say this because cities that were built before the automobile were designed to a human scale. They were built around people. When we go on our vacations, we gravitate to these types of places. When given the choice, people prefer to be in environments that are not dominated by vehicles. Unfortunately though, for the past generation, we have designed our cities in the exact opposite way. Cars are now the major design element in every consideration when we are building our cities. And this has come at a cost. Cars are now so ingrained in our society that we never even seem to question or challenge the sacrifices we need to make in our communities to accommodate this single mode of transportation. I want you to have a look at this photo. This looks like a typical North American city. Nothing out of the ordinary here. But take a closer look. Look how much space is dedicated in this urban scene to cars compared to how much space is dedicated to people. In a typical North American city, about 20% of our landmass is dedicated to road space. Think about that for a moment. Almost a quarter of our most valuable and centrally located land in our cities is dedicated to a single mode of transportation. And then we get to parking. For every car in our city, our cities need to build four parking stalls. We need to build one parking stall at our home. We need to build one parking stall where we work. We need to build another one where we shop and where we recreate. Now you're probably thinking, well, that four parking stalls, that doesn't sound like too much. But when you start to add them all up, it takes up a huge amount of space. Let's imagine we wanted to try and build a parking lot for all of the vehicles in the United States of America. Well, first, we'd have to go down south and pave over all of Washington State. We'd have to cut down all of the trees, cover up all of the mountains, pave over all of the cities, and just put in parking stalls. And even after paving over the entire state, we still would not have a parking lot anywhere close to being able to accommodate all of the vehicles. So we're gonna have to go over to the East Coast and take the state of New York and the state of Ohio and pave over all of those states as well. Goodbye Manhattan, goodbye Central Park, let's turn this into a giant parking lot. But even after paving over all of New York State, all of Ohio and all of Washington State, we still don't have enough parking stalls. So we're gonna have to head down south and we're gonna have to drain the swamp and pave over all of Florida State. 
And even after paving over Florida State, we still don't have enough parking stalls. So to finally get us to enough parking stalls, we had to go to the Hawaiian Islands and pave over those as well. I think we're starting to get a picture of what Joni Mitchell was getting at in her famous song. It is clear that cars have a huge impact on our city and have had a dominating impact in designing all of the spatial geography in the community that we live. But what is our path forward? How can we take a step back? How do we press a reset button on the future of our cities? Well, there are three important steps that we need to take. And the first one is relatively simple. It involves walking. Now you're probably thinking this does not sound like the most groundbreaking thing I've ever heard, but walking is the most important prerequisite to building a livable city. If you are not able to or don't feel inclined or don't want to walk in your city, chances are you don't live in a livable community. If we want to bring our communities together, we need to make sure that their walk is walkable. The next ingredient is public transit. Now, public transit is not very sexy, it's not very glamorous, but it is a critical component to our cities. The reason it is so important is that public transit is incredibly space efficient. A highly effective rapid transit system can move the same amount of people as a 40 lane highway. Now think about that. Think about a rapid transit station compared to a 40 lane highway and the differences that those two pieces of infrastructure would have on your community. Quite significant. Public transit needs to be a part of the puzzle. And the most important step that we need to take is we need to start reevaluating our relationship with cars. Now, cars are still going to be us in the future and it's still going to be an important component on how we get around. But in the future, we are going to have a unique opportunity to think about cars differently. Driverless cars are going to provide us a once in a generation opportunity to think differently about transportation. If we are able to combine driverless cars and the shared economy, we are going to be able to start to think about how we use cars differently. Now, driverless cars are not going to be a magic bullet solution. If we adopt driverless cars like we adopt cars today, chances are we're not going to have any benefits to our city. We actually might end up building worse cities because of that. But if we are able to use driverless cars differently than we use cars today, the possibilities are endless. If we can combine it with the shared economy, we can start get, getting past the fact that everyone needs to own their own vehicle. Given that your vehicle sits idle 96% of the time, we need to ask ourselves, do we need to all own our own vehicle? If we can get past that, that giant parking lot that I described starts to shrink. Now, I hate to admit this, but driverless cars are going to be better drivers than me. They are going to be able to solve the long-held, around-the-globe problem of how to merge. <laughs> They're also not going to do this annoying thing that us humans tend to do on a regular basis. They're not going to be crashing into each other as often. And I think we've all had that experience when we've been driving down the road and everything slows down almost to a halt. Not because anything is blocking the road, but because some bozo up front is staring at a duck or something out the road and slows down to 10 kilometers an hour. Well, I have a confession to make. I am that bozo. <laughs> so if you put me in a driverless car, that changes everything. So if we are able to think differently about how we use cars, not only are we going to save space in parking spaces, but we're going to need less roads. 
20% of our roads in our communities today are designed for human error. We are going to have a unique opportunity to be able to take some of this space back for our communities. So what does this future look like in our city if we are able to take this space back? Well, we don't have to imagine a futuristic solution because cities already today around the globe are looking at opportunities to take space back from cars and dedicate it to people. In Paris, France, along the Seine River, a major roadway has been converted into a series of beaches and public spaces. This has become an attraction for both residents and tourists alike, and it's changed the vitality and how people interact with their city along the river. In Seoul, Korea, a major highway used to go right down the middle of downtown. This highway cut off and segregated and separated their city. When it was removed, a natural waterway was restored. This place is now a green oasis and a gathering place for the citizens all around that community. Now, these type of inspirational projects are not just limited to world-class cities like Seoul and Paris. Cities all over the world are exper experimenting with trying to transform car places into people places. Whether it's building places to hang out, or building places to grow a garden, or taking a parking lot and temporarily turning it into a movie theater, cities are experimenting on how to make our cities more friendly for people. The only limit to what we can do with some of these spaces is our imagination. Heck, we can even turn our cities into a giant water slide if we want to. Now, just imagine if these fun and beautiful places were as common in your community as the roads in your city. It's an exciting opportunity. But I know what some of you are thinking. All of this looks great, those images are beautiful, but there is no way I'm giving up my car. And I get that. I don't expect anyone in this audience today to jump out of their seat, immediately put their car on Craigslist. But what I do hope is that everyone in this room here tonight can start to think differently about how their mobility choices, how their decisions about how they get from point A to point B has an impact on the cities that they live in. That these decisions, probably more than anything else that we do in our cities, shapes the communities that we live in. We have some of the brightest minds in the world working on the technology behind driverless cars.